looking at parables. And why would Jesus use parables? The dictionary defines a parable as a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. The book of Mark has the, the list of parables, meaning that there are more parables in the other gospels. Even the best of of the soils still have weeds and thorns, mm. but you have to continually weed them out, weed them out. And friends, if we are not careful, the sins that beset us a long time ago, when we were, we had not yet accepted Christ, mm. will find themselves coming back. We must continually mortify them. Use of parables in Jesus' time would not be a shocking, strange, in fact, it was an expected thing. It is the concept of teaching the unknown using the known through this parable i'm able to understand how god works in our lives and how god works in in us to influence others to come to him the spiritual aspect then for the church it would be for us to identify with our uniqueness the uniqueness of the adventist message you know and not be ashamed of it not be ashamed of its peculiarities whether it's a health message whether it is uh, the spirit of prophecy and and know that it has a place and a position to play in this last day and uh, and that the messages that they have are there and uh, are relevant for people in need uh, mm -hmm. for this message Happy Sabbath and good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you're joining us from and welcome to another week. I like remembering that safely through another week the Lord has brought us because it is not a, a must for us to be here. So we want to thank God for giving us another day to be here this morning. And thank you for welcoming us into your homes. And so this morning we're looking at miracles around the lake. What miracles are we talking about? Has the Lord done for you a miracle, big or small? And did you notice that it was a miracle? That's what we're going to hear from our panelists today and what the Lord is teaching us from the, from the book of Mark. Today we're looking at four and five and almost into six. So my name is Matthew Dor. I will be your moderator this morning and I'll ask my panelists to introduce themselves, starting with you, Zef. Um, happy Sabbath. My name is Adar Zef. I'm really happy to be here. Happy Sabbath. My name is Seraphine Okemwa. Glad to be here. My name is Onsongo Rafael Nyamiswa. It's a wonderful pleasure. Thank you. And online? My name is Sarah Jackson. It's an honor to be with you. Seraphine, would you like to pray for us? Shall we? Dear God, thank you for yet another opportunity to explore miracles in the book of Mark. God be with us as we go through this lesson and may it be a personal blessing to each and every one of us is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen and amen. So welcome to this week's lesson, Miracles Around the Lake. What lake are we talking about? So we're talking about the Sea of Galilee, in which we see the ministry of Jesus is largely focused, and especially uh, around uh, that sea, which is approximately, we talk about, so this is Kenya, so we're looking at kilometers, so 21 kilometers long and 13 kilometers wide. That's not a small body of, uh, of water for those of us who don't necessarily like water. Um, and, and so that's a large body of water. And, and, and we are told in the lesson today that it's the largest body of water in that area, but it was also the center of the people living in this area. So we're looking at, uh, so this Sea of Galilee, so we look, at the, uh, we look at Jesus and the miracles around the sea. So we look at, it starts with a storm. You know, and I don't know how many of us have ever been in a storm. Um, I believe from what I read that storms are not necessarily good things. Like I told you, I am not one who really enjoys uh, travel on water. So I'll get to hear if any of you have ever been in storms. Um, and then we look at a Jesus. In these stories, we will look at Jesus who is able to calm the storm, a really bad storm. He's the, the Jesus who is able to cast out demons. We have seen that in the previous uh, lessons that we've been looking at. He's able to heal a woman who had been sick for so many years, to raise a dead girl, to, and, and as he tries to preach in his hometown, and what reaction does he get from his own people? And also calling his people, his disciples, to mission. And what kind of mission does he send them to, and how does he start off their work from them? So there's a lot for us to cover this morning. I'd like to start us off by looking at uh, Mark chapter 4. 
verse 35 and 41, when we're looking at the calming of a storm, what is happening in this scenario? And I'd like to read, uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version. So Mark chapter 4 from verse 35 to 41, I'll read very quickly. And the Bible says that on the same day, when the evening had come and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitudes, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep in, on a pillow, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he rose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. And they said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? In this story, we see quite a bit happening here. So remember Jesus had been working so hard. Last week, we looked at even the part that his family had to try and make an intervention for him because he, they felt that he had been overworking himself to a point of not eating and possibly not resting because the multitude follow him. We saw places where the multitudes would actually run ahead of him to get to where he was going before he would get there. So Jesus, as he enters this boat, we see that he was really tired. And the fact that Mark actually says that he entered as he was, was, uh, indicating that really Jesus was very tired. And when he gets into the boat, what he does next is really to sleep. And so uh, immediately he falls asleep in, in, at, the, at, at the stern of the boat. And then we see a Jesus, and when the storm arises, so a storm arises not only on the boat that he was, because also this lesson talks about other little boats that were around him. And that shows in, in, in our lives, really, issues around those around us and those that we influence. Even if you're in the bigger boat, there are little boats around you. So just as I, to put it out there, to remember that you may be inside the bigger boat, but remember there are other boats who you take along with you with your influence, just to put it out there. So there were other little boats, and that's what we see then the wind arises and when the wind arises and beats about the boat Jesus is still sleeping what a God of peace and this shows us he who is the prince of peace that in spite of everything else happening around him the Lord's peace was within him that he could sleep through the storm finally they come to him and they say teacher carest not that do you not care that we are perishing you know, when they come to him, they're like, how can you sleep through this? And there will be those around who are wondering, how is it possible to have this peace that there's so much chaos around him? And when he wakes up, praise be to God, he says, peace, be still. He, he calms the storm. There is a savior walking with us. Who is there to calm your storm? I don't know what storm you are in, my dear brother or sister. And what it is that you feel that this one is going to overwhelm you. Actually, the Bible says that their boat was already filling. Meaning that it was already taking water. Is your boat taking water? Is your family boat taking water? Is your personal life taking water? There is a savior. If he is in your boat, then you can, he will sleep through the storm. And if he's sleeping through the storm, then awake him. Not because you are afraid, not because you have no faith, but because you know there is a savior in my boat, even if it is feeling. So we see them here. And when he wakes up, the first thing he asks them is that, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You have been with me all this time. You have seen me do miracles around you. How is it that you still are fearful when you know I am with you? How is it that you have no faith? Shall I pause here to ask you, my panelist, is the Lord looking at you and finding you afraid about your personal situations, about your boat that may be taking water. Is the Lord looking at us and wondering, why are we afraid? Is our faith standing to understand that he who is with us is in the ship with us? 
I'm going to take a pause right there and I'll come to you, Siam, to see because we can compare the, the lessons that we are learning from the power of God and of nature. And we see again what Psalms 104 talks about, the power of God, and compare that with the calming of the storm in this story. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Psalms 104, I'll read, um, it has nine verses, very, very poetically written. Let me just read this quickly. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Mm. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. Who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes his, the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes his angel spirits his ministers a flame of fire you who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever you covered it with a deep as with a garment the waters stood above the mountains at your rebuke they fled mm -hmm. at the voice of your thunder they hastened away they went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you founded for them. Mm. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. Um, I personally find that very poetic, but then also it's very powerful. The, the, the picture the psalmist is, is painting there is this elements of nature that often confound human beings, you know, forces like water and light and the clouds and mountains, you know, things that are quite formidable. He is depicting God as moving them around at will and, and commanding them. And a God who you, he's depicting a God as using light as a garment and, and commanding waters over hills and, 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 and over mountains and sending them to where they be. It's very clear to the reader of the psalm or the audience the psalms or psalmist was addressing that this is this is a powerful God. And it is the same picture that is brought in um, the story in, in Mark chapter 4 when a sleepy Jesus wakes up and uh, permit my preacher mind to um, allow to say this. He, 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 the, the Bible says he calms the wind and, and, and the storm. It's almost like the picture of a mother um, settling, quarreling siblings. You know, he's telling the wind, can you behave yourself? And mm -hmm. telling the waves, hey, get a hold of yourself, shut up, mm -hmm. you know. And the, the Bible says when he did that, the disciples greatly feared. One humorous preacher said, um, the disciples were no longer sure which storm to fear. <laughs> like this guy in the boat who calms storms like it was quarreling mm -hmm. children or the one in the water which they... They, as former fishermen, were probably more um, used to. But such is the power of God depicted in Psalms um, 104, but then demonstrated in Mark chapter 4. But the story in Mark 4 is, um, I'm about to drop a big English word. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called theophany. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's those words that make you look smarter than you are. <laughs> but theophany is God or an angel, a celestial being, manifesting himself amongst men. That's what really a theophany is. Mm. And when you look at scripture, the various theophanies, the um, appearance of Gabriel to Mary, the appearance of the angel to uh, Manoah, who is Samson's um, parents, the appearance of um, Gabriel to Elizabeth and to, I mean, to, to um, John the Baptist's father. There, there are multiple situations where God appears, the appearance of God to Moses or the burning bush. All those theophanies, five main characteristics seem to appear. Those five characteristics, except one, will be present in this um, story. And when we see which one is missing, then you begin seeing something powerful that um, the writer and God is using to communicate. So the five characteristics is one is the display of divine power, mm -hmm. um, normally a form of brightness or some divine attribute um, showing up. And then the second is um, human fear. That's just normal. If a being who is brighter than the sun suddenly appears in your presence, fear is a perfectly normal response. So display of, the, of divine power. The number two is 
um, human fear. And then number three is the command, do not fear. Mm. The heavenly being God or an angel taking time to reassure the human subject not to fear. Number four is the what you'd think of is the delivery of the message, the, the words of revelation that uh, for which God or the angel have come to, to bring are delivered. And then finally, number five is a human response to the revelation. Those are the five normal um, elements of a theophany. In the story of um, in the story that we read in in, in, in Mark chapter four, um, all of them, all of the elements are there except one. So four of the five elements um, common in a theophany are present. The coming of the storm is the display of of divine power. Mm. Um, I hope that is should be clear by now. The disciples' fear is normal human fear. Mm -hmm. At this point, they're not sure should we, who should we be scared of, the storm or this guy in the boat? And then the question, um, why are you so afraid? That's a question Jesus, uh, Jesus asks them. Mm. Um, uh, I, think it, I thought it should have been self-obvious why the disciples, but that is um, God coming in and doing that. And then the human response after that is the disciples actually worshiping. But the missing detail in all of this, the missing um, four of the five. So the missing fifth detail is the revelation or the secrecy of the of the mission of Christ. And so the disciples still are left with a lingering question: Who is this that the winds and the storms calmly mm. obey? Mm -hmm. And that is done as a very strong, what I call it, stylistic device. It is inviting the reader to imagine this being who is able to calm the storms and is able to um, do that when he's just woken up from sleep. This is not a human being. Mm. This is someone more powerful. Christ allows it to be secret at that particular point because it will be revealed later. But when you're reading with a reader alongside, you're like, this is not just any human interaction. This is not just any normal human being. It is. In, in a real sense, it enlarges, it enriches the divinity of God in the mind of the reader mm -hmm. when they begin questioning this. And the question that I left off thinking when I was reading this is, which things has God deliberately omitted in my life so that it might serve as an invitation mm -hmm. for me to recognize his power at work in my life? Amen. Back to you. Amen, amen, amen. As we think that, we wonder about the power of God and how can we learn to lean more on this power in our personal lives. What are your storms? I don't know what your storms are, but remember, there is a storm karma along with you. Seraphim, we come into another miracle. And this, for me, the title of this, uh, of this lesson on Monday was so powerful for me at a personal level. Can you hear a whisper over the shout? Can you hear a whisper above a shout? Allow me to read Mark 5, 1 through 5. The Bible says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Mm. The demoniac my friends, physically manifests the spiritual condition of a man mad by sin. Mm. We are told his dwelling was in the tombs, a place of death, places of spiritual death, performing acts of sin which signify spiritual death. And we are not told he visited the tombs. No, he dwelt there. Mm in the tombs. Mm. And then we are told no man could bind him. 
for he plucked asunder the chains and broke the fetters into pieces. No restraint against harm and destruction spiritually works for this person. Breaks all the rules put in place to govern their spiritual well-being. Does not read the Bible. Mm. Does not pray. Does not meditate. Does not observe the Ten Commandments. Does not observe the laws that govern their well-being. All safeguards to guard this person or to restrain them from harm are broken. Mm. Again, we are told this man is always in mountains and tombs, crying and cutting himself. Spiritually, this person is unsettled, keeps roaming spiritually up and down, sometimes looks high spiritually. The next time, overly drunk in the bars, causing harm to himself, very sporadic. And then we are told in verse 15 that after exorcism, he was sitting and clothed and mm. in his right mind. Meaning before then, he was roaming, he was unclothed and out of his mind. Spiritually, a spiritually degenerated man is unsettled naked spiritually as mm. opposed to being clothed with the righteousness of Christ and performing acts that are not spiritually sound. There we see the true picture of a spiritually depraved man. But what happens? The man rushed at Jesus. Mm. No word about the disciples. They probably ran off. When the man came near to Jesus, he fell down before him. The words fell down translate the Greek proverb, <clears throat> proskrino, usually translated to worship. It seems the man recognized that Jesus was someone who could help him. Mm -hmm. But when he opened his mouth, the demons inside him shouted at Jesus. Who could mm -hmm. hear the man's whispered plea for help mm -hmm. above the demon's shouts? The, ma the mind of this wretched sufferer had been darkened by Satan. But in the Savior's presence, a ray of light had pierced the gloom. He was roused to long for freedom from Satan's control, but the demon res resisted the power of Christ. When the man tried to appeal to Jesus for help, the evil spirit put words into his mouth and he cried out in an agony of fear. The demoniac partially comprehended that he was in the presence of one who could set him free. But when he tried to come within the reach of that mighty hand, another will held him. Another, another's words found utterance through him. Mm. The conflict between the power of Satan and his own desire for freedom was terrible. It seemed that the tortured man must lose his life in the struggle with the foe that had been the ruin of his manhood. But the Savior spoke with authority mm. and set them captive free. The man who had been possessed stood before the wandering people happy in the freedom of self possession. Mm. Even the demon had testified to the divine power of the Savior. I borrow that from Desire of Ages 255 paragraph 4 and 5. Jesus had the whispering pleas of the man's heart beyond the mm. shouting arrogance. Grace looked beyond the man's fault and saw his need. Mm. Today, we are here looking at the men and the women coming to church who externally shout defiance, mm. shout wretchedness, mm. shout rebellion, shout evil tendencies. Do we see beyond their faults to mm -hmm. see or, be, uh, or behold their need? Do we hear the whispering pleas of these men and women's hearts beyond their shouting arrogance? Mm. Or do we run away from them having given up on them and having branded them because of how hardened in sin they appear to be? Mm. Let's be like Jesus and again let's be ready for an uproar. For sometimes salvation of souls comes at a very high price. Yes. 
cost or loss to the kingdom of Satan. Mm. They lost their subject. The Jews who are not supposed to be at this point rearing pigs in the first place lost their pigs which were a source of livelihood and income. When a sinner joins the fold of God, expect noise, expect mm. uproar mm -hmm. because it is a great loss to his kingdom. Friends, my question to you is, can you hear a whisper above a shout? Mm. Can you hear the whispering helps, pleas of help above their shouting arrogance or depravity? Mm. That is so powerful. <sighs> As I was thinking about that, and I know we're going through a season where there's a lot of struggles among our young people. And many times we look at them and only see the shout of the struggles that they're going through. Can we hear their pleas, the whisper that they are, uh, that they are pleas for help? But I know there's a man who can, the man Jesus Christ. He can hear the pleas even above the shout. So I wonder what, what, what is it in your life that you might be struggling with? There is a man who can hear above the shouts of your struggles. Let me come to you, Sire. Because our next, uh, the next time we see another miracle around us is talking about the roller coaster with Jesus. And it would be nice to see um, what is happening. This is another sandwich story, like some of the, those that we covered last time. So we're looking at a sandwich story here uh, of a religious leader who's come crying for help for his own daughter. And that is interrupted. And what do we get out of this story? So if we could take us through this story to look at this man, Jairus, and also we see what becomes of his story at the end of the day. So the story is um, called The Roller Coaster with Jesus. I, I lift my hand and say, uh, together with my wife, we are bona fide adrenaline junkies. <laughs> and we... We, we do like roller coasters, but we, we, we some time back went for um, a theme park and I think we had more adrenaline for a day. You become tired. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we took all scary rides and everything. Um, yeah, you don't do that in Africa. You do it here so that if, if, if anything ever happens to you, no one is asking you, what were you looking for? <laughs> but back, back to focus, back to focus. And I like, therefore... Um, so the roller coasters take you up and down and twist you. Um, I'm, I'm just saying this for the benefit of people who don't understand mm. what a roller coaster is. So in, in, in Mark 5, verses 21 through 24, the story is told of um, a, a religious leader, one of the leaders of the synagogue. His name is Jairus. A few things pick your eye immediately. You read that story, especially if you have some familiarity with a uh, Jewish setting and the norms of that time. So first thing is Jairus comes running. He, he is coming running. So Jewish men did not run, okay? Didn't run, at least in public. You didn't, you didn't do that. And then secondly, this was a religious leader, okay, who um, must have known the Shema, the, um, the, the Jewish creed of Deuteronomy 6 by heart, you know, um, here in Israel, um, the Lord our God is one, you know, and you shall worship the Lord our God. And so it becomes very obvious something is amiss when he not only comes running, but he falls down at Jesus' feet. So for a Jewish synagogue leader to do that in public, this was beyond um, normal. This was desperate. Mm -hmm. Given the background of the um, interactions that Jesus had had to this point with a uh, um, Jewish um, religious leaders, which harmonious is not the word we can use to describe it. The fact that Jairus comes and um, lays prostrate and um, is pleading with Jesus to come and um, do something for him shows somebody who is desperate. But don't take my word for it. Let me read it for you in Mark 5 verses 21 through to 24. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea and behold one of the rulers of the synagogue came Jairus by name and when he saw him he fell at his feet and begged him um, honestly saying my little daughter 
lies at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. So the details Mark gives us already begins telling you there's going to be a problem here. Jairus' urgency um, is going to be impeded because it's a big multitude. So I don't think Jesus is going to be able to move as fast enough as Jairus would like him, just given the logistics of moving through a crowd. So it's going to be a problem. But there's also a second problem. Jairus is already coming with a formula. Um, Jairus is coming and saying, come, lay your hands on him, he will be well. He doesn't, he, Jairus' request, coming from a desperate father, it's understood, but you, you, when you look at it, he wants to be in charge of both request and strategy. Um, years later, I mean, a, a while later, a Roman centurion would even tell Jesus, no, you don't even need to come, just give, I trust your word enough. And no wonder Jesus would later on say, like, this Roman has more faith than I've seen in the whole of Jewry um, land. So, A, Jairus is desperate. B, um, Jairus is um, not yet fully surrendered. He still is coming with directing the strategy. C, the movement in the direction Jairus would like to is not going to happen as fast as you'd like because it's going to be a crowd. And then, because this is a sandwich story, there's a... This is more than a spanner being thrown in the works. Mm. There's a whole toolbox being thrown into it. <laughs> because from Mark 5, verses 25 to 34, um, another character is introduced. And this is a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. Jairus' daughter is 12 years old. This woman has been bleeding for 12 years. So she comes and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. That was... It, it wasn't a biblical belief. It wasn't a Christian belief. But the belief that um, that was pervasive in those days was that if you touch the hem of a religious leader, you could become well. And so God honors the faith um, of that woman. Oh, albeit it's still imperfect. It's still growing. And then he, Jesus does something that I'm sure Jairus must have been losing his mind at that point. He stands still turns around and asks what seemed initially like a hideous question, like ridiculous one, who touched me in the midst of an entire crowd? Until even um, other versions say that, a disciple said, hey, master, the many guys, hey, anyone here could have touched you. But Christ spoke of a different touch because he felt power leaving him. And generally, 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 women um, are more expressive. They explain things a bit more. Now imagine a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years and who the Bible says has suffered many things at the hands of many physicians and has lost a lot of things. And Jesus turns around and says, okay, tell me your story. I want you to zoom away from that and just think what's happening to Jairus. Like, eh, I came here with a strategy. Can we get moving? And a woman who's suffered that much for 12 years is not about to tell her story in one minute. This was a this was a story told for quite some time. And no wonder, somewhere in the midst of it all, um, the word will come that, hey, Jairus' daughter is not doing um, too well. Now, while Jesus um, dispenses with the lady, he then comes to Jairus' house and heals the daughter. And in the work of healing the daughter, he calls her by, uh, he, 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 he calls her by a fond name and that's the section of the story found from verses 35 through to 43 um, of, of, the, of the story is Jesus raising the daughter. What Jesus is doing here is brilliant. He uses the experience with a woman on the street to not only reach the crowd but specifically to edify Jairus and tell and show Jairus like hey Jairus this woman who's been suffering for 12 years is not insignificant in my eyes or less significant to me than your daughter who is um, at the point of death. The number two, Jesus is able to show I have sufficient power. I'm able to show attention and concern to this woman like there was no one else in the crowd. And then later on, I'm also able to show um, attention and concern to your daughter like there was no one else in the world. 
There is no scarcity mentality in the economy of God. Jairus, who was anxious at that point, must have been operating from a scarcity mentality about the limitedness of God's power. But in his story and the way God deals with it all, God shows us like, no, he's able to heal the woman at the street and pay attention and he's able to come and heal the and raise a girl from the dead and pay maximum attention to her. And so it should be with our lives. At times we want to rush God or we end up rushing our own lives because we don't think God has enough power or enough concern or enough with all to handle my needs personally the same way he can handle someone else's needs personally. The third thing I see in this is God telling us, can you trust me with strategy? It's okay to present your need. You may come with it secretly like the woman who touches the hem. You may come with it desperately like Jairus did. God is not condemning the how because those are normal human emotions, but God is able to show that when it comes to strategy, just trust me with strategy. Mm -hmm. No wonder Paul will tell us, be anxious for nothing. Amen. But in all things with prayer and thanksgiving, make your supplication known. So let's trust God with the office of strategy because he has a thousand and one ways to work for and through our lives that we do not know about. Mm -hmm. And then fourthly and finally, in calling that damsel by name and calling her fondly, Jesus in his miracles at the end of the day, he doesn't want the miracles to just be the end. He is. He wants us to come to a fond, personal, and deep, personable relationship with him. Will we experience this Jesus? Amen. Amen. Indeed, will we experience this Jesus? Rafa, our time is fast spent, so I want us to look at the rejection of Jesus Christ by his own people. That... I don't know where you grew up, but if the people around you saw you today, would they accept that it is, is who you are and who you have become today? Because Jesus' time, let's see what they think about him and who he had become, the people he had grown up with him. Once I was speaking, and then I think one of my childhood friends happened to be in the congregation. And after the meeting, he was very excited. He was very excited, and he said, he couldn't believe that I was the one who was speaking in that, <laughs> in that particular meeting. So I, I really wondered. I, I thought I, was, uh, I wasn't too much of a rascal, but I, I think perhaps I was. And so I think sometimes, yes, it is. Um, in Kenya, in Swahili, we call it uh, amtuetu mentality. Yes. Yeah, so recently the president has selected a cabinet secretary. Everybody wants somebody from their region. Mm. And so I wonder... Uh, what Nazareth uh, would have reacted that Christ came from Nazareth, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's an interesting thing. But on the contrary, we see that in Nazareth that uh, they did not receive him as a hero. They did not receive him by faith and, uh, and accept him um, the same way he was accepted in Capernaum. You see in Capernaum in, 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 in Mark chapter 2, mm. any house he enters uh, in an age where there is no social media, it is full and, and, and things happen. But in Nazareth, they, they are sluggish. They are asking themselves, what's all this halabaloo about? Is it not this guy, a carpenter, you know, mm. son of Mary? Almost questioning even his, uh, his background because they knew that Joseph wasn't his father and uh, they didn't believe that whole angel story. And so uh, in Capernaum, it was just scandal and scandal. And so Christ himself says that a prophet is not what? Is mm -hmm. at home, is without honor. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of this, we're told because of their lack of faith and uh, their lack of, once again, the way they measured him, mm -hmm. you know, the measure with which uh, they received him then. Similarly, he laid hands upon a few sick people. That tells us that a few people recognized him. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And so for that reason, he was able to heal them. But beyond that, it says... God did not, Christ wasn't able to do great things for them. Mm. He wasn't able to do great things for them because they lacked faith. Mm. The story swiftly moves on from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verse 1 to 6, which we have reflected on, to six, uh, chapter 6, verse 7 to 30. And it speaks about Christ now preparing his disciples uh, and giving them uh, the first commission to go and preach and do healing and do many things. And it's interesting that their message was similar to the message of John the Baptist. Mm. And he calls men and women to repentance mm. and to, uh, to, to come to be made at one with God. We find that in uh, around uh, uh, verse 12 to 13, he also gives them the commandment and tells them that they shouldn't be afraid mm -hmm. that, uh, for their provisions, that God will provide. And 
he tells them that wherever they go um, where where they are received they should eat where they are not they should uh, shake the dust off their feet and to proceed in essence asking them to understand that God will provide and that God provides through his people mm. that as they go by faith to do works of, 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 of marvelous works they're not going to be fed marvelously mm -hmm. they're going to depend upon these same people you know it's an interesting thing that uh, he, he didn't tell them that crows would feed them but he tell them where you will go those people don't even look for shoes those people will provide for you talks to us also uh, about how we should receive the people of God and how we should support the, the work of God and that God remembers those who actively participate mm -hmm. and accommodate his people and facilitate the evangel and the gospel. The Bible records um, in verse 12, and they went out and preached that men should do what? Should repent. Mm -hmm. Verse 13 says, and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick mm -hmm. and healed them. They did such a marvelous works that Eventually, we are told now to another sandwich story where Herod who had killed uh, John the Baptist, who spoke truth to power, told him that you've taken your brother's wife and this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And his brother's wife, Herod, Herodias, wasn't really happy, you know. And eventually, on a convenient day, which was uh, Herod's birthday, the daughter, uh, the, the stepdaughter danced and, uh, and uh, the man uh, had promised even half of his kingdom. And uh, this lady, under the influence of her mother, asked for John the Baptist's head. And eventually, John the Baptist is killed. Almost drawing, uh, drawing parallels. We see the message of John the Baptist was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Be behold, uh, he was preparing a forerunner for Christ. Similarly, the disciples had come after the death of John with the same message of repentance. And uh, we see a pattern, so to say. We see the message, its effect. And, uh, and, and its result, in essence. You see, the message was repentance and people coming to, at oneness with God. And this message resulted in the imprisonment of John and his eventual uh, death. Mm -hmm. Similarly, these disciples of Christ and Christ himself coming with this same message were equally speaking truth to power. And those whom this message is rubbed wrongly, they killed the disciples and even killed Christ himself. And so, in essence, this story tells us uh, sometimes some, what could be the effects when you go out to the fields. Some are met with rejection. Some you are met with acceptance. And the, the Bible, then the question is, um, to all of us, have we, ex have we seen uh, rejection? Then it's not something new. Mm. Christ has walked that way before us. John the Baptist has walked that way before us. Even if some, even uh, the patriarchs and the prophets and, 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 and the disciples and the apostles before us similarly met with death because mm -hmm. of the truth. And therefore, whether we are rejected or whether we are accepted, ours is simply to be faithful to the message and to the commission that God has given us. Thank you so much, Raf. I'll come to you, Zef, because... We see a Messiah, and in the eyes of the people, they're expecting the Messiah to liberate them from their enemies. And he disappoints them. And so, what is this disappointment, and why? What kind of a Messiah is he, as we look at Mark chapter 6? Thank you. Thank you, Masi. Um, what, I, what, I, what I get from this passage is that, um, okay, just beginning the story, um, now Jesus is along the Sea of Galilee, and he gets to a point where he needs to rest. And as he moves on, he realizes that actually there's a huge crowd waiting for him. And it looks like it's a movement, sort of. And these people, in their minds, they're thinking, you know, this is a kind of a political leader and not a religious leader, not a teacher as he was. And they would want to, um, for them, because of uh, being under the Roman yoke at that time, mm -hmm. they felt like they needed someone to lift up um, this burden from them, the burden of tax, the burden of... Uh, bad leadership, the burden of um, uh, ex exorbitant uh, uh, lifestyle that they, they were seeing from these people who were leading them. And they felt like they need someone who would actually get them out of um, this Roman yoke. However, um, this, this is evidence in the book of Mark chapter 6 from verse 35 to 38 and that they really wanted to make him king, you know. And, um, but 
as we would re as as we read on we realize that this was not his 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 um his appointment okay this was not what he came to do mm -hmm. and 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 it really disappoints um, many of them and including the disciples i'm sure they might might, might have uh, felt like they, are pla they have placed themselves in a position where they can easily become future leaders for that society in uh, of course in terms of their political um, uh, positions and things like that but this was not to be and actually um, reading from um, Mark chapter 6 uh, from of course from verse 34 to 52 we see um, Jesus feeding the 5,000 people and before then um, the disciples come to him and they ask him um, you should send these people away because we cannot uh, we cannot feed them because they were hungry having listened to Jesus the whole day and they were really hungry and the disciples felt like of course because of the huge crowd they and they were poor disciples of course just fishermen and even at this time they were not even fishing so they didn't have money and like a normal human being would think would was the the best way or the best solution for them was to send this crowd away mm. and so that um they are, they are at least they remain the few of them and they can sustain themselves and then jesus tells them no you like as if he does not understand that he should be feeding that that that, that these people are so many they can't feed them he says can you just give them bread you know um probably to just strike a question uh, or a contemplation with them and 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 and, and it gets to a point where now he t uh, they are wondering what is uh, jesus talking about we should give all these people bread that would mean we should have a lot of money to actually um afford to give all of them bread but then he asked them what do you have and we know the, how the story ends and he ends up feeding everyone and as you read on you, you realize even uh, even at that point the disciples had not even believed what he had done and he goes ahead to appear to them later on in the evening and another miracle uh, 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 was was met by jesus at that time and what do I learn from all this? Um, I see uh, sometimes we might have really mixed up react uh, mixed up um, ideas on how we should handle this message, especially maybe like prophecy. Mm -hmm. You know, we we think like this is how it should go, but you know, s maybe we are wrong. We are thinking like human beings, so we need to uh, f fix our minds with that of divine um, uh, appointment like what is happening uh, here in this story so that we know exactly what God is expecting of us and and so that we are in the right path you know now if they would have gotten this wrongly like how they did you know they the, the wrong part which they got was Jesus had come to deliver them from the Roman yoke and yet it was to deliver them from um, sin. Mm. He was appointed to, to them as a Messiah mm. to deliver them from sin. And this was because this was his first, um, uh, first advent. And we know that when he comes for his second advent, he has a different purpose. So sh we should not get these concepts wrong. Mm. This is what I learned from this story. We should not get, get these concepts wrong. We should, we should uh, affix ourselves with the divine appointment, the divine story, the divine um, revelation of who God is to us and our, our, our responsibility at this time. Reading from Mark chapter 10, verse 45, I'll just uh, read that quickly. Uh, it says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. And that was his task at that time. Mm -hmm. But the disciples had, uh, got, got it wrong. And, and this uh, is um, an encouragement to, to us listening. Sometimes we might be wrong about our prophecy. Sometimes we might go ahead because of our human, um, our human understanding to uh, try to help God do some things or to advise God um, to do some things, but, but he has his own way. You know, he has his own way. From, the, from Proverbs, uh, we read that 
the, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, mm. but to end, the, end, the end of it leads to death. Mm. So we should not trust our way. We should trust the path that God has put place uh, in front of us mm. so that he can lead us. Because if he leads us, then we know that we will not be wrong about his prophecies. We will not wrong, be wrong about times mm. that he is directing us to, to do. Yeah. Amen. Our time is fast spent and I'd like you all to think about your closing remarks. I like how this end this different kind of a Messiah because the truth is he, ha he had come to deliver them from a bondage only that it wasn't the Roman bondage. It was the bondage of sin. And if the closest ones to him and he had told them over and over again, they just didn't hear him. And I pray that we will hear what the Lord is telling us. Because it's very possible to keep hearing the same message and missing it. So my dear brothers and sisters, I pray that we will not miss the message that the Lord has for us in this his second coming. As we go into our closing remarks, we had a further thought that came from the book of The Desire of Ages. And I'd like to read very quickly, Desire of Ages, um, quoting from page 363. Uh, in all who are under the training of God to be re revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs or its practices, and everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart when every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him. The silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. He bids us be still and know that I am God. We are being encouraged this morning is that to allow our hearts to be so quiet in the stillness of God's presence that we may hear him. And sometimes we need to shun out the world ar around us that we may hear him speak to us. Our closing remarks, my dear panelists, starting with you, Raf. I think what I learn is that uh, in a world in which we are very sensitive uh, and uh, in which we, gay, we look to garner acceptance from our peers and uh, from, our, from those who are older than us, then that rejection is a reality. You know, and that Christ himself faced rejection. Initially, even amongst his, uh, mm. his, uh, his, his family members, though later on they came around, and even the village and the people who grew up around him, they questioned uh, his power and his mission. And as a result of that, he couldn't do much for them. Mm. Similarly also, I think, uh, if we truly depend on God and believe in him, then perhaps his effect and his power in our lives is equivalent to as much, uh, as, as much faith as we exercise mm. in him. And therefore, let's not be fearful of rejection. And even when rejected, let us know that Christ was there. And let's not seek validation and acceptance outside of truth. Mm. But let us learn to go where truth is and to go where Christ has sent us and know that he will provide for us. Amen. Uh, for me, I want to ask the question again. Can you hear a whisper above mm. a shout? Mm. You know, that Sabbath morning, when you see this girl coming into church with a very short skirt mm. or a very low top or quite adorned with jewelry, are you first mm. to judge them? Or are you first to ask how are you doing? Mm. How is your social, you know, how is your social life? How are you physically? How do you feel inside? I mean, are you first to know about their well-being before you can judge them and condemn them? Number two, when we see people who we call extremists, mm. okay? When we see legalists in church, are we having this attitude towards them that is hard, fast, firm. You know, some people are extremists because they find validation right there, but internally they are crumbling. Mm. My encouragement to us as a church is let us not be too quick to pass judgment and to condemn people mm. and indeed to brand them. Let us be the people who will see beyond their externalities and reach out to their need indeed. Thank you. Amen. 
Um, just to um, conclude, I, um, what I, I garner from this uh, uh, lesson is that, number one, let us understand, let us understand the prophecies correctly, and this is not upon us. It's upon the Holy Spirit that works in us. And, and once we listen to what God is speaking to us, then we, we, he will guide us to the right direction. And I'll just uh, finish with a hymn um, that I used to sing when I was in high school. It says, Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in the time appointed, his reign on earth began. He comes to break oppression, to set the captives free, to take away transgression and rule in, in equity. So he comes to take away transgression. That is his main purpose for his first advent. His second advent will be to reign in equity. Mm. So we have hope and trust that even after all this um, mayhem is done, even after all this sickness, even after all this bad leadership and all these um, wrong things that we see happening in this society, Christ will come and he will rule in equity. Amen. Finally, sire. I think for me it's a words of a uh, song that says, um, a fervent prayer rose up to heaven, a fragile soul was losing ground, sorting through this earthly bubble, heaven heard its cry. This was a life of no distinction, no successes, only tries, yet gazing down on this and lovely one, there was love in heaven's eyes. Um, mm. In heaven's eyes, there are no losers. In heaven's eyes, no hopeless cause. Amen. Only people like you with feelings like me, and we are all amazed by the grace we can find in heaven's eyes. Though at times um, we need miracles um, to get us going, the end result of miracles is not the miracles themselves. In all the miracles we studied this week, they were a starting point for people to have a deeper relationship with God. I want to ask that we also um, have a similar relationship with miracles, not to either discount them mm. or to be overly dependent on them, but let them have their correct position, which is the beginning point of an ever deepening relationship and dependence on God. Amen, amen, amen. We've come to the end of this Sabbath, uh, Sabbath school lesson this morning. My dear viewer, may the Lord calm your storm. I don't know what storms you may be going through this morning, but there is the Lord who is in your ship. May he calm your storm. But the question is, is he in your boat in the first place? Because if he's not, how does he calm a vessel that he's not in? I pray that the Lord, number one, you will accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You will have a personal relationship with this God that we're talking about this morning so that you can experience him. And the miracles that we're talking about today will become a part of your life. I know in the world today, there's a lot of talk about miracles and there are a lot of false prophets out there and a lot of promises of false miracles. But we've talked about a miracle that leads us first to get to know the God of the miracles. Study the word of God for yourself, my friend, that you may not be deceived. Study the word of God. Get to know this Jesus for yourself that you may not be deceived. And as you get to know him, may his life be real in your life. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless your families as you go into this new week. Shall we pray? A kind and loving Father, thank you for the lesson that we have learned around the miracles around the lake. And we are learning from the story of Mark that, Lord, you are still there to calm our storms, to hear the whispers of our crying hearts above the shouts of the demons that beset us. I pray that, Lord, you'd be found in our lives and you would change us, O oh God. The desire of our heart is that we may know you as a pers at a personal level. We may have a transforming experience with you. The Lord, you may walk with us every day of our lives. That even as they waited to know the Messiah, we may know the soon coming Lord. Be with us today, our Father, and into the new week we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.